I was going to say good morning, but I think we're nearly good in the afternoon. <laughs> Thank you so much for your patience. My name is Lily Hunzimana, and I serve as a representative uh, to the United Nations for the Baha'i International Community. And it's really an honor to have all of you here and really thank you for taking the time to come and spend with us here at the Baha'i International Community. I would like to first acknowledge and thank uh, the delegates um, from Kenya to the CSW and the Office of the President's Advisor on Women's Rights for coming to join us today. Um, it's, it's really been a pleasure to collaborate um, with our office to put together this event and hope it will be a fruitful discussion. I also want to thank the co-sponsors of this event, um, NGO CSW, I recently joined um, the executive committee as a member of large, at large, so I'm really happy to also welcome you in that capacity. Um, and also Anda Vijana Initiative for co-sponsoring this event. So thank you so much for, for supporting us. Before we get started, I just want to share um, a bit of a reflection of really how this event came together. Um, Lanji and I have been having some conversations after we, we posted a number of events here, um, particularly on youth. And, you know, the, the youth population on the African continent is projected to be at 2.5 billion by 2050. And uh, that means in 25 years, uh, Africa will, will compose 25% of the world's population. And today, Africa has the youngest population in the world, with 70% of Sub-Saharan Africa under the age of 30. So really, this provides an opportunity for the continent. Um, and in the context of the Commission on the Status of Women, uh, ahead of the Summit of the Future, we really wanted to um, create an opportunity to discuss how we can advance financial inclusion in harmony with the promotion of women's rights and equality, it's an opportune moment to also assess the role of societal institutions in creating just and inclusive societies, as well as thinking about how do we create a foundation for the continent's well-being today, but also into the future. And we hope that this conversation will feed into the Summit of the Future process and conversations that we we'll all need to be participating in. So really, we have a, a few goals for today. We want to honor past achievements that have been made specifically on the continent of Africa, and one of our speakers will speak to that. Um, we want to reflect on how we can re recast institutions according to principles of equality and justice. We also want to think about institutional frameworks that have fostered successful initiatives on women's and young girls' financial inclusion. So we have individuals in this room who will share that with us. So I don't want to speak too long because we, we want to also create space for others to come in. But we also have um, Dear Lanji, um, who's, with, uh, who's also an advisor to the permanent mission of the Republic of Kenya to the United Nations, to, to say a few welcoming words before we pass it on to the keynote speaker. So over to you, Lanji. Thank you, Lila. Um, good morning, delegates and colleagues. We're very happy to have you here join us today. Um, welcome to what promises to be a vibrant conversation on the sidelines of the CSW 68. Thank you for joining us as we embark on a journey into the essence of Africa, Africa's future. The government of Kenya would like to thank our gracious co-hosts and partners, the Baha'i International Community, and a special mention to my colleague and neighbor as the permanent mission is on third floor of the same building. Um, thank you, Lily. It has been a very profound and brainstorming um, period over as we've discussed this session. And trying to discuss what the future of Africa means, particularly in the lens of African youth, because I think we discuss the future of Africa from multi-dimensional aspects, but we don't really get de delve into what that means for the youth. We hope today's theme, the future of Africa, an intergenerational dialogue on strengthening institutions to cultivate financial inclusion for women's rights and equality, reignites your passion for transformative change in Africa. Statistics have a knack for jolting us into reality. By 2050, Africa's population is projected to approach 2.5 billion, comprising a quarter of the global population. With 70% of Sub-Saharan Sub Africa under 30 years old, these figures fuel our collective sense of purpose. May today's conversation create meaningful engagement beyond now and beyond the summit of the future. One exemplary figure leading the charge in Kenya's engine of public-private partnership is the Office of the President's Women's Rights Advisor, anchored by Honorable Harriet Chikai, who's here with us today. 
who I'm very happy to serve on Matters Global Affairs. This parallel event is one of many conversations and projects she is pioneering to ensure the youth have a seat at the table. My presence as an officer in her office is a symbol of the commitment seeking voices of the younger generation, a meaningful seat at the table, not just as placeholders or tokens. Through her tireless efforts, she has forged meaningful alliances, not only with massive conglomerates, but also with youth who are inspiring drivers of innovation in their communities, unlocking new opportunities for economic empowerment and social inclusion. The collaborative approach not only amplifies the voices of our youth, but also paves the way for sustainable development and prosperity for the generations. The statistics presented today serve as a sobering reminder of the work that lies ahead our not so gentle reminder of the urgent need for action and collaboration in addressing the challenges we face as a generation that no longer waits for opportunities, but creates them. Let us remember the importance of building inclusive tables where all voices are heard. I encourage each one of you to actively engage in today's dialogue. Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, Lachi. Um, it's, it really has been a pleasure working together. Um, I now want to open the floor for Honorable Harriet Chigai, the Executive Office of the President and of the President and Office of the President's Advice, President's Women's Rights Advisor. Excuse me. Over to you, Honorable. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, delegates, both who are seated here and the ones who are on the online platform. My name is Harriet Chigai. I serve the President of Kenya at the capacity of uh, Human Rights Advisor to the Office of the President. Allow me to first acknowledge the distinguished guests seated here. I can see we have a big delegation from the Kenyan government. And you all know when we talk about policies, when we talk about laws, those policies and laws don't wear any hat without our members of parliament. So I can see we have Gadoni Wamshomba, our vibrant member of uh, uh, parliament in Kenya. We also have uh, Senator Catherine Muma. We also have our PS, permanent secretary on matters MSME, Susan Mageni. And my left, I can see we have our permanent secretary, Teresia Mbaika, on matters devolution. This is the whole of government of Kenya in terms of <laughs> we need <laughs> to ensure that policies and championing of any issues legal can actually go through. And I really want to thank them for finding time. Sorry? The deputy governor. Oh, we also have the deputy governor from Migori County, which is the other side of the government. Thank you, of Kenya. Thank you very much. And we also have the CEO of uh, National Government Affirmative Action Fund seated here with us. So you can actually see that whatever discussions we are having here has the weight of government. So allow me then to welcome you all and to thank you for finding time. You can see we have quite a number of representation cutting across board. The reason as to why we're having these discussions is the question of where is the future? Where are we going? Where are our youth? And where are we holding uh, our youth? and where do we want to take the dialogue going forward. And I wish to thank uh, the Baha'i community for allowing us in this space and for the work that you're actually doing in Kenya. I've just learned that they have one of their uh, institutions, we live one of our very most local or village or rural areas within Kenya. So thank you very much for the good work that you're doing. So allow me then to delve into my opening remarks and I would wish that we have as much as possible we delve into this matter. So I'll try and take a shorter time so that to allow intervention from all of you and I would wish all of us to participate. So as we gather here today for the CSW parallel event hosted by the government of Kenya in partnership with the Baha'i community, international community and esteemed partners. And as I reflect on our theme of today, the future of Africa and inter an intergenerational dialogue on strengthening institutions to catapult financial inclusion for women's rights and equality. A breath of fresh air, not only for the future of Africa and collaborations with the women and youth, but also a deep sense of hope for the progress we are charting in the push for financial inclusion. Let me give a snapshot of the government of Kenya bottom-up economic transformation agenda 
This plan aims at improving the livelihoods and welfare of all Kenyans. It has five core pillars, namely agriculture, micro, small, and medium enterprise, housing and settlement, healthcare, digital superhighway, and creative economy. The better plan is premised on the promise to drive the economic turnaround and inclusive growth agenda for Kenya. Africa stands at a pivotal moment in history, with its population projected to reach close to 2.5 billion by 2050, making up a quarter of the world's population. Moreover, Africa boosts the youngest population globally, with 70% of sub-Saharan Africa under the age of 30. More so with the population of women standing approximately at about 51%. This demographic reality presents us with boundless opportunities for innovation, growth, adaptation, and progress. Yet amidst these promising prospects, we are acutely aware of the challenges that persist, particularly in ensuring gender equality and financial inclusion for women and particularly the young women. Today, we gather to acknowledge these challenges and more importantly, to confront them head on with courage, determination, and unity. The theme of today's dialogue emphasizes our commitment to advancing women's rights and empowerment through transformative intergenerational engagement. By drawing on the wisdom and experiences of older generations, we seek to strengthen the institutional frameworks that promote financial inclusion and empower women to access resources opportunities on an equal footing. In this room, you're not just participants in a dialogue, you are the architects of, of change. You're also engineers of change. We must all take up this role. Let us seize this moment to forge partnerships and exchange ideas. This will propel us to chart a course towards a more just, equitable and prosperous Africa for generations to come. I'm proud to say that the Kenyan president, His Excellency Dr. William Ruto, stands firmly behind the women and the youth of Kenya. He believes in wholeheartedly in their potential drive, positive change, and innovation. Through initiatives such as the Hustler Fund and the establishment of the county industrial aggregation parks across the country, our government is investing in the next generation of leaders, entrepreneurs, and change makers. These initiatives not only provide financial support and resources to aspiring women and young Kenyans, but also nurture their talent and ambitions. It further empowers them to pursue their dreams and make a meaningful impact in the society. The office's collaboration with dynamic young individuals who are affecting change globally is paramount. For instance, Lipa Luta Group, operating in six countries across the continent, is integral to a gender-responsive data project this partnership will serve as a powerful reminder of the critical importance of cross-generational collaboration in driving institutional reforms and to form um, solutions pegged on real-time data. Our commitment to women and youth empowerment goes beyond financial assistance. It is ingrained in every aspect of our governance and policy making. From education reforms aimed at equipping our youth with the skills and knowledge they need to succeed in their healthcare, in the modern world, to initiatives promoting access to healthcare, employment, and civil engagement, we are dedicated to creating an enabling environment. This is to enable every woman and young Kenyan to thrive and reach their full potential. As we look to the future, let us embrace the spirit of collaboration, recognizing that our strength lies in our diversity and our ability to work together towards a common goal. Let us heed the voices of our women and young people let us harness their energy, passion, and creativity to drive forward the reforms needed to build a more just, equitable, and prosperous society for all. Let us engage in meaningful and progressive dialogue. Let us ensure that, that this isn't just another side event. May we depart from here feeling inspired, re-energized, and fully prepared to undertake the crucial task of reshaping the future of Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Honorable Guy. And I, I really um, especially appreciated the emphasis on the need for courage, determination, and unity in all of these endeavors. And I really appreciate um, you taking the time to address us and, and share your, your thoughts with us. Uh, and I want to turn the floor over to Dr. Ateno Boya, who is the representative of the Baha'i International Communities Office in Addis Ababa, which represents the Baha'i community to the African Union. Over to you, Dr. 
Thank you. Good morning. It's actually afternoon now. Good afternoon. <laughs> and uh, it's really my pleasure to make a few comments. We have a really um, sort of overwhelming representation from Kenya, so we'll stay with it. <laughs> we will stay with the Kenya case study for today. And of course, I recognize that there are people here from other African countries, and we can now uh, have the discussion on a broader scale. So I just wanted to, you know, some some of the notes that I wanted to make was around women's agency. Okay, women's agency in Kenya, which really becomes apparent in the scholarship from the time of the, the struggle for independence. Okay, women's organizing and agency becomes very apparent there. And, and then that's followed by sort of apolitical self-help groups that are ubiquitous around Kenya. Um, and then from the 1950s, we start to see sort of a national organization for women that by the 1970s, sort of the decade for women that the UN um, then declares, we have this Mindeloya Wanawake, a national umbrella organization for Kenya, and also the National Council of the Women of Kenya. And, and so as we move into the 1980s, you know, the embeddedment of Kenya within the global economy and the turn to neoliberalism, we start to see the emergence of a lot of non-governmental organizations, and among them, women's rights organizations like FIDA Kenya. Um, you know, I'm really thrilled that uh, some of the representatives that I was talking to before we even came into the room are members of FIDA Kenya. This is the uh, Women Lawyers, International Women Lawyers Organization, and the League of Women Voters. These are sort of two key um, national NGOs that emerged from the 1980s and, and their platform has really been felt significantly in the country in the movement for gender equality. So from a behind perspective, we really see that, you know, this idea of gender equality, equality of women and men is actually, we, we see it as a spiritual truth. It's a spiritual reality, okay? And it's a, it's a spirit, it's a, it's a principle that is really reflecting the, the, age, the time of our, of our age today, okay? And the fact that uh, for society to advance, men and women have to really advance in an equal plane. So one of the images that's, uh, that we use, we like to use is think of a bird. Okay, a bird has two wings, right? If one of the wings is weak or broken or absent, that bird cannot fly. So if we think of the male as one wing and the female as the other, this is the argument for equality becomes very apparent. And for us as Baha'i, we see this not just as a material reality that must be reflected, but also the spiritual truth. For the Baha'i community in Kenya, sticking with the Kenya case studies, in 1975 at the Mexico conference that launched the Decade for Women, we had a representative, a Kenyan woman that represented the Baha'i delegation officially there. And then nationally, we've had in Kenya national conferences for women, local conferences for women, and the way in which these are organized is really women themselves identifying what are the issues that we are facing in our village, in our city, in our nation. And these voices then really create the agenda for a women's program in the national Baha'i community. And how are these funded? Because I know we're talking about funding today, right? Um, these are funded really from the communities financial kitty, which is something that um, Baha'is contribute to voluntarily, okay? And, you know, in our discussion, and I know there's so much experience on this table in this room today, and I'll be looking to, to really learn from you all as well. I think what we offer um, in this Baha'i example is that however humble one is, their contribution is welcome. And the way in which we do this is we use the process of consultation, okay? So consultation meaning that everybody's ideas are welcome. And once you've shared your idea, it's actually no longer yours. It belongs to the group, okay? And so it's for the group to take on this idea and develop it in a way that works, in this case, for women's advancement, okay? So consultation is one of the key bedrocks for Baha'i operational activity of advancing the spiritual principle of equality of men and women. I just wanted to actually close by mentioning that, of course, men and boys have a role to play in advancement of, of uh, equality. And when we talk about you know, finding a space and ensuring that there's financial allocation for women's activities or gender equality activities, one of the things we need to ask ourselves is, what are the attitudes and habits that even make this something that we need to be 
discussing today. Why is it that we don't already have this platform of financial inclusion for women? So we definitely need to unpack and understand the harmful attitudes and habits that are keeping women um, really subordinate to men and not having the resources they need for their advancement. So that's one area that um, I'm hoping we can talk about. And of course, this is really speaking to a moral attitude. Okay, it's really around a moral attitude and, and one that should really come from a peace-inducing foundation for advancing equality, not one of sort of violence and adversarial um, positioning. Um, then the second point I wanted to close with was, can we think of any positive attitudes and habits that can actually foster gender equality? And once we have these positive attitudes and habits, um, you know, providing the material resources for realizing gender equality would become, if you like, just a natural outflow of this. And third, how can these positive ha habits and attitudes be mainstreamed, not just in Kenya, but in our continent as well? So just with those few remarks, I'm really looking forward to engaging a conversation with the amazing experience on this table and in this room today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mboya, for highlighting the, the historical achievements that have been that have been made uh, specifically within the case of Kenya, um, but also highlighting the, the women's organizations that have been founded 